Willemville Stories Part 6, Shame, by Stephen Crane, short stories, Shame, Willemville, Stephen Crane. Don't come in here bothering me, said the cook intolerantly. What with your mother being away on a visit and your father coming home soon to lunch? I have enough on my mind and without being bothered with you. The kitchen is no place for little boys. Anyhow, run away and don't be interfering with my work. She frowned and made a grand pretense of being deep in her culine labours, but Jimmy did not run away. Now they're going to have a picnic, he said half audibly. What? Now they're going to have to have a picnic. Who's going to have a picnic, demanded the cook, loudly. Her accent could have led one to suppose that if projectors did not turn out to be proper parties, she immediately would forbid this picnic. Jimmy looked at her with more hopefulness after 20 minutes of futile skirmishing. He had had at least succeeded in introducing the subject. To her question, he answered eagerly, Oh, everyone, look, everybody coming, lots and lots of boys and girls, everybody. Who's everybody? According to custom, Jimmy began to sing song through his nose in quite indescribable fashion in enumeration of the prospective picnickers. Willie Dalzell and Dan Earl and Ella Earl and Walcott Margate and Reeves Margate and Minnie Phelps and oh lots more girls and everybody and their mothers and big sisters too. Then he announced a new bit of information they're gonna have to have a picnic. Well let them, said the cook blandly. Jimmy fidgeted for a time in silence. At last he murmured, Now I thought maybe you'd let me go. The cook turned from her work with an air of irritation and amazement that dim Jimmy could still be in the kitchen. Who's stopping you? She asked sharply. I ain't stopping you, am I? No, admitted Jimmy in a low voice. Well, why don't you go then? Nobody's stopping you. But Jimmy said, I, you now, each fella has got to take something to eat with them. Oh ho, cried the cook triumphantly. So that's it, is it? So that is what you've been shying round here for, eh? Well, you may as well take yourself off without more words. With that, with your mother being away on a visit and your father coming home soon to have his lunch, I have enough on my mind, and that without being bothered with you. Jimmy made no reply, but moved in grief toward the, the door. The cook continued, Some people in this house seem to think there's about a thousand cooks in this kitchen. Where I used to work before, there was some reason in them I ain't a horse. Picnic. Jimmy said nothing, but he loitered. Seems as if I had nothing to do without having you come round talking about picnics. Nobody ever seems to think of the work I have to do. Nobody ever seems to think of it. Then they come and talk to me about picnics. What do I care about picnics? Jimmy loitered. Where I used to work before, there was some reason in them. I never heard to tell no picnics, but right on top of your mother being away on a visit and your father coming home soon for his lunch, it's all foolishness. Little Jimmy learned his head, leaned his head flat against the wall and began to weep. She stared at him scornfully, crying, eh? Crying? What you crying for? <laughs> Nothing, <laughs> sobbed Jimmy. Well, there was a silence, save for Jimmy's convulsive breathing. At length, the cook said, Stop that blubbering. Now stop it. This kitchen ain't no place for it. Stop it. Very well. If you don't stop, I won't give you nothing. You go for picnic with there. For the moment, he could not end his tears. You never said, he sputtered, You never said you'd give me anything. And why would I, she cried angrily, why would I with you in here crying and blubbering and beating and uh, enough for the dry old woman crazy? I don't see you how you could expect me, I have no idea. J Suddenly Jimmy announced, I've stopped crying, I ain't crying, I ain't gonna cry no more at all. Well then, grumbled the cook, well then, stop it, I've got enough on my mind. It chanced her that she was uh, making luncheon for some salmon, a tin still half full of pinky fresh fish was prepared by her table. Still grumbling, she seized a loaf of bread and wielding a knife. She cut from this loaf four slices, each of which was as big as a six-shilling novel. She profligately spread them with butter and jabbing the point of her knife into the salmon tin, she brought up bits of salmon, which she flung and flattened upon the bread. She then crashed the pieces of bread together in pairs, much as one would clash cymbals. There was no doubt in her own mind, but that she had created two sandwiches. There, she cried, that'll do you all right. Let me see, what'll I put them in? 
There, I got it. She thrust the sandwiches into a small pail and jammed on the lid. lid. Jimmy was ready for the picnic. Oh, thank you, Mary, he cried joyfully, and in a moment he was off running swiftly. The picnickers had started near half an hour earlier owing to an inability to quickly attack and subdue the cook, but he knew that the rendezvous was in the grove of tall pillar-like hemlocks and pines that grew on a rocky knoll at the lakeshore. His heart was very light as he sped, swinging his pail, but a few minutes previously his soul had been gloomed in despair. Now he was happy. He was going to the picnic where privilege of participation was to be brought by the contents of his little tin pail. When he arrived in the outskirts of the grove, he heard a merry clamour, and when he reached the top of the knoll, he looked down the slope upon a scene which almost made his little breast burst with joy. They actually had two campfires. Two campfires! At one of them, Mrs. Earl was making something, chocolate no doubt, and at the other, a young lady in white duck and sailor hat was dropping eggs into boiling water. Other grown-up people had spread a white cloth and were laying upon it things from baskets. In the deep, cool shadow of the trees, the children scurried, laughing. Jimmy hastened forward to join his friends. Homer Phelps caught first sight of him. Ho! he shouted. Come here, Jimmy. Here comes Jimmy. Trescott, come on, Jimmy. You be on our side. The children had divided themselves into two bands for some purpose of play. The others of Homer Phelps' party loudly endorsed his plan. Yes, Jimmy, you be on our side. Then arose the usual dispute. Well, we got the weakest side. Tain't any weaker than ours. Homer Phelps suddenly started and looking hard said, What you got in the pail, Jim? Jimmy answered somewhat uneasily, Got me lunch in it. Instantly that brat of a mini Phelps simply tore down the sky with her shrieks of derision. Got his lunch in it, in a pail. She ran screaming to her mother. Oh mama, oh mama, Jimmy Trescott's got his picnic in a pail. Now there was nothing in the nature of this fact to particularly move the others, notably the boys who were not competent to care if he had brought his luncheon in a cold bin, but such is the instinct of childish society that they all immediately moved away from him. In a moment he had been made a social leper. All old intimacies were flung into the lake, so to speak. They dared not compromise themselves at safe distances. The boys shouted scornfully, Huh? Got his picnic in a pail? Never seen a well, never seen again never again during that picnic did the little girl speak of him as Jimmy Trescott. His name now was him. His mind was dark with pain as he stood, the hang dog kicking the gravel and muttering as defiantly as he was able, Well, I can have it in a pail if I want to. This statement of freedom was of no importance and he knew it, but it was the only idea in his head. He had been baited at school for being detected in writing a letter to little Cora, the angel child, and he had known how to defend himself. But this situation was in no way similar. This was a social affair with grown people on all sides. It would be sweet to catch the Margate twins, for instance, a hammer them into a state of bleating respect for his pale. But that was a matter of the jungle, of childhood, where grown folk seldom penetrated. He could only glower. The amiable voice of Mrs. Earl suddenly called, Come, children, everything's ready. They scampered away, glancing back for one last gloat at Jimmy standing there with his pail. <laughs> he did not know what to do. He knew that the grown folk expected him at the spread, but if he approached, he would be greeted by a shameful chorus from the children, more especially from some of those <laughs> damned little girls. Still luxuries beyond all dreaming were heaped on that cloth. One could not forget them. Perhaps if he crept up modestly and was very gentle and very nice to the little girls, they would allow him peace. Of course, it would have been dreadful to come with a pail to such a grand picnic, but they might forgive him. Oh no, they would not. He knew them better, and then suddenly remembered with what de delightful expectations he had raced to this grove, and self-pity overwhelmed him, and he thought the, he wanted to die and make everyone feel sorry. 